This video will explore distribution augmentation for generative modeling developed by researchers at OpenAI. In addition to excitement about GPT-3 and its ability to generate stories and write code, OpenAI has also recently published their image GPT model. This was a 6.8 billion parameter autoregressive generative model, similar to how GPT-3 works, but on ImageNet images and modeling pixels rather than language tokens. Distribution augmentation is a study about how to use data augmentation to improve generative modeling, particularly with these autoregressive models. Data augmentation describes semantic label-preserving transformations to data, like rotating it or making it more blue or red, that has been a massive workhorse for deep learning and computer vision. DistAug takes on a multitask approach to embed the transformation of the data into the start of sequence token, making it so the model can distinguish the true P of X data distribution compared to P of T of X after the data has been augmented or transformed. The paper ends with a plot showing the benefits of more augmentation and more scale, hinting that this could be a huge contributor to an image GPT-2 sequel. This video will explain the algorithm and go through the details of the experiments in distribution augmentation from OpenAI. This video will explain distribution augmentation for generative modeling, developed by researchers at OpenAI. This work suggests continued interest in developing these large-scale autoregressive generative image models and perhaps developing an image GPT-2 model. Data augmentation has been one of the key workhorses in computer vision models and deep learning. This is where we take images and then we augment them by rotating them or doing these color injections or blurring them with something like a Gaussian blur, adding noise, or all these things that we can do to images in order to either do these two different ways of looking at how exactly data augmentation is improving these models. One view of it could be that it's preventing overfitting because we just have uh, more data and we're not overfitting to this one view of the cat and we have these other views that kind of uh, broaden out the generalization and kind of the region and space that this cat image is occupying in this high dimensional image manifold. So then another way of looking at it would be that this is a way to inject inductive biases. It isn't just that we're increasing the size of our data set, it's that we're telling it to be invariant to rotating the cat. It's an inductive bias to tell it that, that an upright cat is still a cat when it's rotated or when it's pink, it's still a cat. So we can either see it as these two ways, it's preventing overfitting by giving us a larger training data set. And we're also, this is a tool to put in these inductive biases of these priors into our deep learning system. So a quote from the paper, is that gains are not only due to the scale of augmentations applied, but also due to the helpful inductive bias of certain transformations. So data augmentation is not just about making a bigger data set, it's also about the ways that these uh, data augmentations are providing priors to the deep learning system. Personally, I've been really interested in data augmentation as a tool for enhancing these deep learning models and using this kind of data space regularization. In this survey paper, I basically just tried to find all of the different uh, image data augmentations that are being used and found things like these uh, geometric transformations, the rotations, the translations, random erasing where we're blurring out the or cropping out a region like a rectangle in the image, color space transformations, making the cat pink, uh, mixing the images, just smashing the pixels together, or taking some average of two images, and then kernel filters like applying a Gaussian blur over the image, and then some other more interesting things like adversarial training and when you uh, produce adversarial examples, and then you train the model on those adversarial examples, kind of what happens as you do that at scale. Uh, can we use neural style transfer, this kind of uh, funny thing of uh, converting the style of like a Van Gogh painting into a cat image? Could that be useful for data augmentation? And then uh, can generative models be used as a data augmentation for image classifiers? And then these meta-learning approaches that uh, have this like higher level of controlling the strength of data augmentations. So if you're interested in looking at this uh, survey paper, it's just an overview of uh, all these different kinds of data augmentations that are being used in miscellaneous computer vision papers. So it's very obvious how to apply data augmentation to supervised learning algorithms. You just augment the data and then just add it back to the training set and just treat it like any other training data point. It's also been pretty easy to apply in contrastive self-supervised learning where we augment two views of an image and then use those as the positive pairs and then the other images as the negative pairs to do this self-supervised representation learning. But applying data augmentation for generative models like uh, GANs, these autoregressive models, or variational autoencoders or flow-based models is a lot harder because these uh, augmentations leak into the generated data distribution. 
this generative model is learning this p of x, the distribution of the data. And as you start to apply p of t of x, t being the transformation, the generative model is not going to know this and it's not going to be able to invert the true p of x. So it's going to start producing data that's been augmented. So this is some pictures from uh, training GANs with limited data where they show that if you rotate the images, the GAN produces rotated images as well. If you apply a blue histogram shift, the GAN produces, the generator produces blue images as well. Before we get into how DistAug is going to use data augmentation for autoregressive generative models, here's some of the previous work that's been really successful with applying data augmentation in the generative adversarial network framework. On the left is balanced consistency regularization. The idea here is to have a consistency loss on the discriminator between original images and then augmented views of that same image. So you would have uh, something like an L2 loss on the, uh, log the real fake logic prediction on the two images, like a contrastive loss learning algorithm, where you're contrasting the difference between a real and an augmented view of that image. And then this latest approach, training generative adversarial networks with limited data, uses this discriminator goggles framework, where the real and the generated data both go through an augmentation before they get to the discriminator. And the idea there is that this augmentation has to be carefully designed such that the discriminator can invert the P of X from the strength and the, you know, the way that you do the sampling of the augmentations. The idea behind dist aug is inspired by approaches to multitask learning, where you'll condition on some task information to inform the model about what task it's currently performing. So rather than just training the model on modeling the density of augmented images, so that you're doing P of theta of X in this image, and then P of theta of T1 of X, T2 of X, and T3 of X, where T1, T2, and T3 are augmentations sampled from a family of transformations, T, capital T. And so this is describing the family of transformations. It could be something like RAND augment from researchers at uh, Google, where they have this uh, curriculum defined by N, which is the number of data augmentations to apply in sequence, and then M is the strength of those augmentations. So you might apply three augmentations, like rotation, translation, and then horizontal flipping. And then they have a magnitude, like rotate at 30 degrees compared to five degrees or 45 degrees, and then how strong I'm gonna zoom in, translate, all these different things. So you're sampling these data augmentations from a family of transformations that will be denoted capital T, although not in these images. So the idea behind DISDOG is that we're not just gonna model the density of the transformed images and treat it as if it's any other data point in the data set that's learning this autoregressive conditional probability model where you're modeling, say, you're at uh, this pixel. You're putting the probability mass on this pixel based on all these previous pixels that you've seen. If it's just kind of like left to right autoregressive uh, generative model. But the idea in DISDOG is to condition on the transformation of the data. So we'll have these embeddings where we map the different augmentations into some uh, like dense vector representation. And we're going to condition the autoregressive generative model by injecting this into the start of sequence token. So it's going to be doing this multitask learning where it's not just going to model the probability density as if this rotated pink cat is any other image of the cat, rather it's conditioned on this transformation of the image. In this slide, we'll try to get a better sense of how they're going to embed the transformation information into the start of sequence token for autoregressive language modeling. So this image is from the image GPT paper, generative pre-training from pixels, where they show the difference between autoregressive modeling and something like a denoising autoencoder mass language modeling like was used to train BERT in language modeling. So we're going to inject this task information, the sampled uh, transformations, T sub 0, T sub 1, T sub 2, which is the parameters of how we augment the image. So in within this embedding, it has to encode that the cat's been rotated, it's been made pink, or it's been blurred out and made green. So there would be many ways of doing this multitask conditioning. The most naive way to think about this would be to have something like a one-hot encoded vector where you have like one zero 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 one zero zero what that denotes the transformations that have been selected in this uh, like discrete categorical set of different parameters of the augmentations but probably what they do and i'm not exactly sure about i'm, I'm certain that they don't use a one hot encoder uh, conditioning but they probably map that uh, one hot encoded vector that represents the categorical variable of the transformation into like a dense uh, vector lookup table kind of similar to how uh, like word token embeddings go into this lookup table before they get into a language model. So they probably use some kind of conditioning like that to get it into the start of sequence token so the model can make use of this dense vector that represents the task it's trying to perform, which is modeling the density of these pixels 
given this transformation of the original image. So similar to GPT, GPT-2, and GPT-3, OpenAI researchers are going all in on this autoregressive generative modeling, compared to something like a generative adversarial network framework or a variational autoencoder. And the difference here is that rather than just going from X into a high resolution image through a series of upsampling convolutional layers or upsampling convolutional layers interleaved with uh, self-attention layers or some kind of variational encoder, encoder, decoder framework, they're gonna be modeling the density of this pixel given these pixels and they're doing it as if this is just a sequence to sequence thing like what's used in language modeling. So at the start of this sequence is gonna be the embedding of the transformation of the image and then they're gonna use that to condition as they continue the generation. So these, these are some examples from the original image GPT paper where they use something like a six billion plus parameter model to model all these images. And there's probably some stochastic sampling in the output that leads to how they get these different completions. But now we're gonna be able to get different completions by giving a different uh, conditioning with the transformation. And to generate just original data like this upright cat, they're gonna just condition on the identity function. So it, if it's not augmented at all, they're not just gonna not condition it at all. They're still gonna have an embedding for an identity transformation in the conditioning on the uh, sequence model. So the math in this picture is showing how dist aug is a data dependent regularizer. And we have this omega term that we can use to weight different transformations differently than others. So say we want to have a curriculum of the loss function on how much we're gonna penalize the model for incorrectly modeling different transformations. So, uh, modeling this rotated in pink image of a cat is harder than just this slightly rotated version of the cat. So we could have this curriculum of how much we penalize the model, and we can do all these different things to focus on different kinds of transformations, and this different uh, data-dependent regularizer, meaning uh, that we can increase the strength of the loss function based on these different subsets of the data and the different augmentations applied. So as described previously, dist aug is inspired by these multitask learning algorithms that will condition a model on the task it's trying to perform. So it's learning how to do all these tasks, these different transformation, P, T of X given T, sampled from this family of transformations, capital T. And then we see this difference between uh, the images when we apply this conditioning information compared to if you just don't tell the model at all or don't give it that embedding in the start of sequence, that it's being modeling this certain transformed version of the image. The authors test out Distog with a 152 million parameter autoregressive model on the CIFAR 10 data set. And they show some pretty good results. You can see examples of the generated images here. And on this slide, you see a comparison with nearest neighbors from the CIFAR 10 data set in the inception embedding space. So you would take all the images from CIFAR 10 and from the autoregressive language or autoregressive pixel model, and you would pass them through the inception image classifier. And then when you have these vector representations from the inception model, you'll cluster them based on those higher dimensional vectors and then look for the nearest neighbors in that kind of uh, clustering space. Or I guess you don't have to actually cluster them. You can just do the nearest neighbor lookup directly from the embedding vectors. But so this shows the nearest neighbors and you see in most cases, it doesn't look like there's much overfitting. Maybe these frogs, definitely these uh, cars. And then you see, you know, pretty unique images based on this kind of nearest neighbor in the Inception's feature space comparison. So this table is one of the more exciting things about this paper that's hinting at a potential image GPT-2 with even more parameters and scaling up this dist aug technique to make image GPT work even better for, say, image net modeling and also for representation learning in the process. So this is showing that as you increase the number of parameters and the strength of the data augmentation, this is... Uh, rotation, maybe translation, colorization, and the jigsaw augmentation, you see this trend in more data augmentation and more uh, model parameters leads to better performance. And this is the uh, bits per dimension evaluation metric where lower is better. And then you see the baseline model is interesting as well. You see without any augmentation, the, as you increase the number of parameters on CIFAR 10, it goes up. Maybe it's overfitted to the 32 by 32 CIFAR 10 images. But so this is a promising trend and showing that this technique may be uh, really important for scaling this up further. The original image GPT paper takes on the ImageNet dataset downsampled to 64 by 64 resolution images. But unfortunately, the dist aug augmentation doesn't really result in massive performance gain on this dataset. It only really works well on the much simpler CIFAR 10 32 by 32 dataset. So this hints that uh, we may need a massive scale to make this work well on complex data sets like ImageNet, even the downsampled 64 by 64 
uh, version of ImageNet, although there's still so much diversity in that data set. CIFAR 10 is something like 50,000 images compared to like a million images in ImageNet. So the diversity is also a huge factor that would make generative modeling uh, more difficult. But you see this slight uh, improvement from going from 152 million to 303 million parameters. But image GPT is something like six or seven billion parameters. So it's likely you have to scale it up like that as well to see this work on ImageNet. So here's another interesting finding from the paper that's interesting for deep learning models in general. They find that with regularizing these deep generative models, you get more out of more data augmentation and then less dropout. So dropout is another way of, if we're thinking of data augmentation as a way of regularizing our deep learning models and preventing overfitting, a rivaling technique would be something like dropout or stochastic path dropout, where we take a neuron in the network and we just exit out as we're going through the forward pass, or we exit out a whole path in the network. So that would be one way of looking at regularizing deep learning models. Another way would be something like weight decay or uh, L2 regularizations on the magnitude of the parameters in the network. But what they show is that instead of doing this, you get better results from increasing the amount of data augmentation as you see this metric going down. And I think this is interesting as well because especially things like the lottery ticket hypothesis and showing that these sparse neural networks are what is the goal of this network. It's not get, it's not like dropping this out and then making it use the full forward pass of the entire width or depth of the network is going to make it a better network because it seems to be biased towards a sparse activation anyways. So this dropout approach maybe isn't, it's kind of, at least it also isn't intuitive compared to data augmentation where we also are injecting these inductive priors through this interface with our deep learning models. So I just think it's an interesting plot. And I personally also think that more data augmentation is a more interesting way of regularizing these models. It's interpretable compared to something like dropout. And I just think it makes more sense with these models. These are the results of trying this AUG with a 15 million parameter uh, autoaggressive model in CIFAR 10 compared to the scaled up 152 million parameter version. So this is one of the interesting findings behind this table on the smaller scale 15 million parameter model. They find that the rotation augmentation works better than the jigsaw augmentation. So this is an example of the jigsaw augmentation. You take an image and you partition it up. So you have these different uh, like tiles or puzzle pieces of the image, and then you just scramble them to get another data point. So you would replace this ground image with the horse's uh, back and just flip it and then add this one to the data set as well. But they find that the rotation where you just rotate the images works better than the jigsaw augmentation at this 15 million parameter scale. So it kind of comes down to the core view of how data augmentation works. Is it just about amplifying the data and training on a data set of size 2n or 4n compared to n? And is that what's preventing overfitting and then connecting this path along this natural image manifold that's super high dimensional? So it makes sense that we would want to have some neighbors in this high dimensional space to connect the path. Or is it a way to inject priors into the model akin to convolutional layers? So it's definitely doing both of these things. It's definitely also uh, you know, amplifying the data and then also injecting priors, but the priors thing might be the more interesting way of thinking about it because the rotating the image, it creates a more semantically similar image in the data set compared to this kind of uh, rearrangement of the image that really, especially this one, doesn't really mean much. So it's kind of interesting to think of exactly what is the benefit of doing this data augmentation. Thanks for watching this overview of DistAug for generative modeling developed by researchers at OpenAI. It's going to be really exciting to see what they do with this algorithm as they scale up the number of transformations, maybe integrate some new transformer architecture and scale up to a massive amount of parameters for maybe the subsequent image GPT-2. This paper also covers using this technique with a pixel CNN model and a flow-based generative model, as well as using text data augmentations that I recommend checking out the paper to get more details about. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.